Welcome to my talk. Um, I would like to make this somewhat interactive. So I will be asking you questions, and if you want to say yes, just raise your hand. We're going to make this agreement that uh, anyone who's recording here is not going to be taking pictures of the crowd, so you can give honest answers. <laughs> um, there will be some slides that are worth making a picture of, and I'll tell you what's a good time for that. And lastly, if you learn something interesting, please share this on social media and spread the security message. This is the GopherCon uh, hashtag and handle. My name is Natalie, and I studied computer and software engineering, and I loved the classes about parallel programming, and I loved practicing with CUDA. I started writing Go in 2014, and in 2017, I attended DEF CON, the world's biggest security conference in Las Vegas, for the first time, and I was completely mind blown. I never changed careers, but I did remain curious, and I am still doing uh, CTFs, or Capture the Flag uh, competitions, and I'm going to the CCC Congress in Europe every year, and I'm trying to attend DEF CON when I can. Now I'm working as an engineering manager in a Berlin-based startup that is fighting fraud in online payments. We need to be really quick when we're doing this, because whenever you buy something online, nobody likes waiting. You also have to be super robust, because we have really serious SLAs. That's why we're using Go from the first day as our backend. In addition to all those requirements, we have to go through PCI compliance training because we're handling credit card data. And generally, you know how Europeans and privacy are. <laughs> so we have to go this training of uh, security in code uh, every year. And the one, this training from this year came at a really good time for this talk because that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to say a special thank you to Elena Grachovac from Berlin and to Baruch Sadugorski from California, on whose talk I'm basing this one. And I want to say many thanks to everybody who reviewed this talk and gave feedback. Uh, this helped making this content pretty up to date. Having said that, security is a field that changes really quick. Keep refreshing your knowledge to stay up to date. So let's start. The first thing that you talk about with security is usually the traditional seven-layer model, right? In this talk, we're going to focus on these four. How to write the secure, how to keep the data secure, how to write secure code, how to keep the dependencies secure, and how to keep your containers secure. Let's start with data. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Passwords. They need to be encrypted. So if your user provides your passwords, that's easy. Ask the database to encrypt them. But what if you need to generate them? Random, right? Let's run it several times. Oopsie. Not so random. What can we change? The seed. So let's take a seed uh, instead of this constant. Let's make it uh, time, for example, right? That's not constant. What's going to happen now? I managed to do enter fast enough to make this repeat twice. So if I can do this fast enough, the computer can do this really fast. So imagine how many times you're going to have the same password generated. Furthermore, if anybody has your seed, they can generate your passwords. And time is kind of an easy choice for everyone. So bad idea. What is a good idea? Crypto slash RAND. That should be good, right? Look safe. I didn't manage to do it enter fast enough. I guess the computer will not as well. It really is a good choice. But raise your hand if you know what crypto slash rand does. Hands down. It uses a system call to get the values from your operating systems cryptographically secure pseudo random number generator APIs. What does that even mean? So we have the passwords figure out. Let's talk about user personal data, like email or address. Logs show this private data, and they can leak. So make sure that you stay safe already on the log level and mask your logs. You can use tools like Sumo Logic, Splunk, FluentD, or even the enterprise version of Elasticsearch to mask specific fields from any user. And then anybody who wants to do debugging still doesn't have access to the logs. So 
Data can leak through logs, but how about passwords? Secret management is a whole new level. How to manage them safely? Step one, don't store passwords in your code. You think I'm saying the obvious? People are horrible at secret management. There are so many passwords you can find simply by Googling. OK, so whoopsie made a mistake. Let's fix it. How am I going to fix it? Not by deleting them. Simply deleting them is a terrible idea. Unless you're going to nuke everything from your history, you're going to get in serious trouble. So what should you do? Use a good uh, tool. Kubernetes, right? Should be great. Raise your hand if you do trust Kubernetes to manage your secrets. I know you all know where I'm going with this, but we said we're going to be anonymous. Raise your hand, don't be shy. <laughs> I see a few hands in the crowd. OK, I have some questions for you. Remember, raise your hand if you want to say yes. Do you know how Kubernetes stores the secrets? Yeah, good. Do you know who can access the secrets and modify them? Do you know how can I see who has accessed and modified them? Do you know how are they transferred to the application? Let's zoom in to using secrets as environment variable. It's a common practice recommended in the documentation. Who does that? Some hands, OK. I, I get the fact that you're shy. Remember, the camera is here. It's safe. When you have a chance, try typing this. See what values do you get for the environment variables. This is a good time for a picture. I want to remind you that if you do have your system permissions in place, you're good. But if you happen to have this hacky setup of a young startup that you share the admin or something like this, see what wonders are you going to get with running this real quick. So what is a good alternative then? A dedicated secret management tool like Vault by HashiCorp. It's open source, it's written in Go, and it's easy to get the values from the app and not from the environment variables. And it has a straightforward SDK to integrate into the app. How to keep your code from exposing security threats. Now that you have the data figured out, let's start with input validation. People are usually conscious about this when it's microservices, and then you say, yeah, I'm going to check the buffer overflow, I'm going to check the valid ranges. But are you doing the same if your front end is your only consumer? If you're using a third party app, are you checking the inputs and making sure that this is sanitized and validate? If you're consuming someone else's code, don't assume that they're doing this. Don't assume that they have the extra uh, mile that they take. Just test it before you use the external applications. Um, basically, assume your user is a troublemaker, but they also don't know what they're doing. So first time I went to DEF CON, I did some of the newbie training. And the first thing that they talked about was the SQL injection. And that was very early in the training. And you think that by now, everything would be safe from it. But then you come across code like this here and there. And what you see here highlighted is SQL injection in the very first function. We can get any name here. The solution, escape variables and sanitize and make sure to utilize the fact, of the, the fact that SQL uh, driver will make sure that you're safe. What if you need to insert multiple values? Solution looks easy, right? Don't give in to saying something like it's probably OK and it's only internal. For a named parameter, you do need to loop with uh, the index as a parameter. Yes, it's another loop. Yes, it's going to make your performance decrease, but it's worth it. Do the right thing. Next, static code analysis. There are several tools that can check all this for you. One uh, that is very popular is called GoSec. I have run the previous code example through that, and it highlighted the part that there is a weak random generator, because using one as a seed is a bad idea. And it also shows two SQL injections. It also shows the severity of the problem, and it points you to the part of the code. So GoSec, great tool. Use it. If you want to block certain libraries, for example, you don't want any of your developers to be importing rand uh, math rand to be able to, to generate passwords, you can use something like Depcard to make sure that specific libraries are not uh, allowed in your import list. 
and that card is a part of Golang CI Lint, which is a great open source tool that basically is a linter's aggregator and it saves you all the headache of thinking to run something before the build and actually paying attention to the linters. It kind of forces you to do this. So Golang CI Lint, great tool. Who uses pprof? Great tool for profiling, right? So let's say I have this handler and I just imported it and then what happens now is that anyone who has access to my code through listen and serve can get my profiling data. The way to go about this is to have separate handler that you use for profiling, se separate handler for external access and so on. Or you can use something like Nginx to channel your traffic from local to go to, to be able to access those handlers and anything external to block their access to things that include pprof. And last but not least, fuzzy testing. This is how testing should be done. Exceptional logic, invalid values, anything that doesn't make sense, try. Also, if you want to try, attend and do CTF challenges, this is also the way to go about this. If you try to break it and you couldn't, then you're actually doing a good job. Third, dependencies. Essentially, dependencies is somebody else's code. Uh, one thing is when you do the standard libraries, but how about third-party code? Should you trust random pieces of code written by strangers on the internet? <laughs> Given that most of us in the room are already doing this, seems like the answer is yes. Okay, you trust your dependencies. How about transitive dependencies? Everybody uses this library, so it must be safe, right? But what are the dependencies of your packages? Do you know that you have transitive dependencies? This is a picture of Dave that I took earlier this year at the .co conference, where he ruined many people's days when he asked them, are you sure that this does not exist in your code base? If you cannot see this well, it basically shows this random library that shows uh, the checks basically if there's any error, nah, it's fine, it's nil. It's just a random library from the internet, must be okay. So, some suggestions on make, you should ask yourself uh, before you insert dependencies into your system, aka the checklist. What is the quality of your code? Is it good? Is it secure? Do they check for SQL injections? If there's no test coverage, you can't assume that it's gonna be safe in production. If it's abandoned, how can you be sure that security patches are applied? Are the maintainers trustworthy? Is it written in a secure, manage, in a secure way, or are we gonna find some kind of behavior like we saw before? And what are the licenses of that software? Great time for a picture. This is a topic that was discussed by Russ Cox in a post from earlier this year. This is how you can access it. You have to help me with taking pictures faster. There's a time pressure here. So let's see for examples in the past where those questions were not asked and what went wrong. The Equifax breach. This is one of the deepest security breaches of our time where over the course of four months, hackers took information of 148 million citizens and their personal information from this credit scoring institute. What happened is that Equifax was using Apache. Apache needed a patch, but Equifax is so big and has so much code that they were not sure if they use it and where they use it. And by the time they patched it, this so much information became free. What do we learn? Picking safe dependencies is not enough. You have to make sure you patch it. Know what your transitive dependencies. If you use a specific library, know what libraries it uses. Continuously monitor new discoveries. If you need to patch something, somebody has to tell you how to do this. A great tool you can use for this purpose is Dependabot that creates pull requests for you to review whenever there is a new version update. It supports Go and it is open source for, free, for open source projects. Upgrade swiftly. Once you know that you need to upgrade, make sure you do this fast. This also means that make sure that your infrastructure supports fast updates across the entire system. Next example, just last year, a JavaScript library maintainer decided to hand over the library to another person because they got tired out of it. 
And what happened? The new maintainer put in code to steal your crypto coin. <laughs> what do you learn from that? Multiple maintainers is better than one maintainer. And automatic upgrades can have risks because, hey, that's how so many people found this code there. Same for dependencies. Lock the dependency versions. Next, um, there's this NPM JavaScript library that has 11 lines of code that pads it from the left. The reason you need that is that uh, most of the frameworks require this. One day, this person decided to remove this from the NPM repository, and that pulled it from everybody's local environment. What happened is many websites crashed. We learn from here that immutable dependencies are a must. Central repositories can be risky. Um, running further, last example is the most terrible one. There's this popular JavaScript library whose maintainer does not like the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement and decided to change the license to say that any company that collaborates with them, specifically the ones listed here, are not allowed to use this. That person did it in a way that he uh, updated only the, he updated the ma major version, not the minor version, against the consensus, and it actually got merged. And then so many people who are using uh, this library in all those organizations opened their company to a lawsuit. Luckily, it was reverted really quick. But just imagine you're this one developer in Microsoft who accidentally auto-updated. You opened your company to lawsuits. So, what do we learn from here? Licenses can be really scary. Minor updates need your attention. To summarize, be ready to take a picture. We're going to make this quick. I'm going to tell you when. Control your dependency tree. Add dependencies consciously. Continuously verify the dependencies and always have a reproducible build with safe uh, dependencies to fall back to and update them frequently. Picture time. Now, we're going to discuss about solutions in Go to help you with this. Um, there are two types of it. There's the built-in ones, and there are tools that are part of it. Go will fail your run if you have unused import uh, imports, so that's good. Regularly check and update your Go mod file. Unused packages will be deleted from it, and any transitive dependencies will be added into it. So that's a way to keep you safe if you pay the attention. Use uh, uh, databases like the NVD to read about new vulnerabilities and take Go report card, picture time, uh, as a minimal sanity check to show you all the problems that you may have in your code. Last is containers. We're going to talk about multi-stage builds. How do you build containers? On the CI or CD nodes, the compiler, uh, you have all the tools that you run tests, which is fine unless you use several programming languages, and then you need compiler and tool per language. So the alternative you can do is use multi-stage builds. <coughs> In multi-stage builds, you basically break it down to a few stages. First, build the app. Uh, that's replace the root user to another user, and this is where all your other apps will run from. Next, um, run the binary. So this is the very basic image. You're going to put here things like a certificate, passwords, and so on, everything it needs for running. Do what you need with the code as well. And then also have a separate image for testing and for running. And don't trust linters and external libraries for testing, because better safe than sorry. Another way, yeah, sorry. We jumped quite a lot. So use policies uh, as code, which is the idea of writing code in a high-level language to manage and automate the, uh, the policies. By representing the policies as code, you're going to be safe with doing things like version control, automated testing, and automated deployment. Kubernetes policies for security, container, for security in container deployment cluster level resources. Um, this controls the security by defining a set of conditions that a pod must meet in order to run in the cluster. For example, you cannot run specific containers in privileged uh, mode. Keeps you safe. The network policies is a set of network traffic rules that are applied uh, for a given group of pods in a Kubernetes cluster. And using 
the network plugin. This is still in alpha, but you can use tools like Calico or Weave uh, who work in layer three for this. And you can use this open source tool uh, for securing the software, software, software supply chain for Kubernetes uh, applications, for example, Critis. Are you overwhelmed? I speak fast, I'm sorry, I know. Automate. You don't need to think, we don't need to think. We need to put the software to follow those policies for us because the same way you don't want to run the build, the linters before the build, but you want to automate this, all this security that we discussed should be automated. Also, go for DevSecOps. It involves creating the security as code uh, culture with ongoing and flexible collaboration between release engineers and security teams. You can see it in the word. The security part comes right between the dev and the ops. Here's a recap of everything we went through today. Feel free to take a picture. This is the last picture for today, for this presentation. We discussed the data, so you can keep your password safe by using a good random generator. You, can, you should use your personal, the user personal data safe by uh, masking all the relevant fields in the logs. Use good tools for secret management. For the code part, check the input validation, check for SQL injections, Use tools for static code analysis and make sure that any handlers that you have and should be external have external only information. For the dependencies part, follow the dependency checklist, look up all kinds of updates that they have, stay up to date. If you need scary examples, go back to those, the one that we covered. And use the solutions that Go provides. For the containers, consider using multi-stages build and follow the recommended policies. Thank you. And spread the word. Talk with us about this with everyone and keep up to date with whatever happens in the security world. DEF CON usually takes place in August every year and this is where many security breaches are being discussed. So I know it's summer vacation, but heads up. Yeah. So how do you obscure user identifiable info while making it easy to debug? Use the existing solutions for logs. Going to run really quick here. Quick recap for everyone. If you want to make another picture of how to do this, I would recommend. Anybody remembers where was that? There it is. These are some tools that you can use for masking logs uh, that contain user data. So there's Splunk, there's FluentD, there is Sumo Logic, and even the enterprise version of Elasticsearch. Uh, this allows you to set user permissions, and then depending on the permission, you can see, for example, a name uh, of the field, you can see maybe the, the length of the field, but you don't see the actual value. And then your developers don't get to see the address or email address or phone number of the users of the system. Thank you.